was happy to see so many of you here. Before we begin, I'd like to remind you, as I always do, to turn off your cell phones and other things that beep and ring and break into song. We have a few announcements about uh, things that are coming up at City Club. Next Friday, our Friday Forum will be sizing up the Portland Police Bureau with Chief of Police Rosie Sizer. Get it? Other upcoming events, today our final Friday has been moved to the next to final Friday because of a spring break. So at 4.30, between 4.30 and 6 tonight at uh, City Club Commons, we'll be having our final Friday with refreshments, conversation, a chance to talk to other City Club members and their guests. Uh, everyone's welcome, no RSVP is required. Next Monday, we will have our Citizens Read book group at 7 o'clock. The, the book for this month is called The Wisdom of Crowds by James Surowiecki. And there will be a discussion moderated by PSU professor Steve Johnson at City Club Commons. This event you should RSVP about and uh, with Kim who is in the back or by calling City Club or email, emailing Kim McCool at City Club. We are so fortunate today to have four new members. I'd like to introduce the new members, ask them to stand, and then after they've all stood, ask you to help me welcome them to City Club. Our new members are Nick Call. Nick, are you here? Yes, there he is. Dan Eisenbass, Tim Tricky, and Amy Rainey. Welcome to City Club. Today uh, marks the beginning of our spring membership drive, and um, for you uh, members and guests, we have quite a deal for you. You hear there is no such thing as a free lunch, but in fact, there is at City Club. All new members who join between now and the end of May, and all members who recruit a new member, will receive a free lunch until the vouchers run out anyway. Compliments of our friend and member, Al Jubitz. And I would just like to plant an idea here. A few weeks ago, uh, Max Wendell, who's sitting right down here, who's a high school senior, and his father, Peter Wendell, uh, we were talking and about joining City Club. I pointed out that Max is almost 18. He had a birthday coming up, uh, that memberships for people under 30 are half price. And at that time, he joined. I think since then, he's had perfect membership. And, you know, he's a senior. He can do that. So uh, I, I think this is a wonderful graduation gift. It's a wonderful gift to give to uh, a young person in your life. Uh, they'll remember uh, the values of civic engagement that you've passed along long after things like clothes and CDs are long gone. So I will hope that everybody here will think about who they'd like to invite to be a member during our big push uh, here between now and the end of our fiscal year, which is the end of May. <clears throat> City Club of Portland is so fortunate to have great corporate sponsors who share our interest in civic engagement and community service. Our sponsors help make the programs that we have here today possible and available to a radio and television audience. I'd like you to ask me to uh, ask to join me in thanking our sponsors this quarter who are Schwabi, Williamson and Wyatt and KeyBank. Our program today is entitled Measure 37, What's Next for Oregon? And indeed, what is next? Since ballot measures 37 passed in 2004, over 7,000 claims have been filed, covering in excess of 500,000 acres and potentially costing state and local governments tens of millions of dollars. Even those who watch Measure uh, 730 claims closely are short on answers to many of the questions we have about how it will work, what it will cost, and the impact that it will have. Our speakers today are Senator Larry George from Sherwood and State Representative Greg McPherson from Lake Oswego. Both legislators serve on the Joint Special Committee on Land Use Fairness. State Senator Larry George, who's on my immediate right, is co-owner and founder of George Packing Company, Inc., 
a hazelnut processing and marketing operation in Newburgh, Oregon. And he's also the owner of George Advertising, a political consult consulting firm that works on public policy issues. Senator George is a property rights advocate and has served as executive director of Oregonians in Action, the nation's largest property rights organization. He continues to serve as treasurer of the Oregonians in Action Political Action Committee. Larry is the former host of the Daily Morning Drive radio program, quote, Daybreak with Larry George on AMKUIK. He also co-hosted, along with Portland City Commissioner Randy Leonard, Oregon Crossfire on uh, KXL. He's currently doing a, uh, a radio show on KXL with Senator Burdick entitled With the Experts. It's a four minute show uh, on Friday mornings. State Senator Greg McPherson, uh, on my far right, is a third generation Oregonian. Greg grew up on a dairy farm in rural Lynn County and is the son of Hector McPherson, who's widely considered to be the father of Senate Bill 100. Greg's father and grandfather both served in the Oregon legislature and were respected for working across party lines. Greg has continued the bipartisan cooperation uh, tradition, and proof of that is that in 2004, he was re when he was reelected to the House, he had the distinction of rece receiving both the Democratic and Republican Party's nominations from his district. Greg has been an employee benefits lawyer with Stoll Reeves for the past 32 years, and he's listed in the best lawyers in America. Greg plays the bagpipes as a member of Clan McClay by Bagpipe Band, and he's marched in the Rose Festival Parade seven times. We'll begin with Senator Larry George, followed by Greg McPherson. Thank you very much for the invitation to uh, come and visit with you today. Uh, I grew up on a, a filbert farm in uh, Yamhill County. My parents still live there. However, they no longer uh, raise filberts. Uh, they've quit doing that, and they raise exclusively hazelnuts now. <laughs> Glad to see there's a lot of native Oregonians here, because when I tell it out of state, people don't get that. <laughs> the fact is, is that, uh, is that being in the nut business it, out of the farm is not that much different than being in the legislature, because a lot of it's about terminology and, uh, and what we call it. What actually happened was is that we all raised filberts, but we did a poll, and what we found is, is that 50% of American consumers will eat a filbert, but 85% of American consumers would eat a hazelnut. So we decided to quit growing filberts and grow exclusively hazelnuts. And, uh, and then I moved into the processing business, which even got to be better, because then I got to buy filberts and sell hazelnuts, and then that was a really good business. <laughs> the fact is, is that what we're dealing with when it comes to public policy is so much is about terminology. And when we work on issues such as land use planning, many times people get into the, the debate of uh, you are either pro-planning or you're anti-planning without any regard for what is actually happening on the ground. And I, last time I got to the honor to come and visit with you folks, I think it was 1994 that I was a speaker here, and we discussed some of the problems back in 1994 about the problems that existed within Oregon's land use planning system. There's fundamental issues that are problems that the legislature every year has refused to acknowledge and, and deal with. There's usually somewhere in the average of between 100 and 150 land use bills at the legislature. Uh, there's a great deal of fretting, there's a great deal of, of controversy, and usually nothing gets done. And unfortunately in our state, that's been the policy on a, major, a series of major policy areas. And what happened is, is that problems that clearly existed within the land use system were never, ever dealt with. And when you don't deal with a problem, eventually the public comes forward and says is enough is enough. The voters did that in the year 2000 with ballot measure 7, which was a warning shot that basically they wanted landowners to be treated fairly, and primarily what this dealt with is the situation with rural property owners. And that was thrown out by the courts, but the legislature was on notice that the public was supportive of the concept of some kind of major change to the Oregon land use system. In the 2001 and the 2003 legislative session, there was again a great deal of discussion, but zero action by the legislature in dealing with these issues that were real problems on the ground. And uh, the legislature refused to deal with it. So the voters came forward and said ballot measure 37. But rather than passing 
with 54% of the vote, it passed with 61% of the vote. So on the second time they got to review the issue and hear all the arguments again with, with uh, a great deal of money spent, the bottom line is the voters voted for ballot measure 37 to reform Oregon's land use planning system. Let me kind of explain to you what the problem is for rural Oregonians, because this is really about the urban-rural divide. This is about an understanding of what's going on for Oregon property owners, specifically what's happening to rural Oregonians within the, the framework of the planning system. When Senate Bill 100 and 101 were first proposed, if you listen to the tapes, I don't think there's anybody today that would not have voted for those pieces of legislation. As they moved through the legislature, there was a great deal of discussion, but I think we've come to the point where we recognize that planning is an essential function of government. So the idea was, is how do we protect our prime farm and forest land from development? How do we do that? And there was a number of incentives and, and ways to accomplish that through Senate Bill 100, 101, and then there was other pieces of legislation that went along with with that package. What happened between the passage of 19, in 1973 of, of Senate Bill 100, 101 and the entire land use package was a series of administrative decisions and within that environment there was this great political debate of whether or not you repealed the land use system or not. I think there was three statewide votes on that. And it was an incredibly heated political environment where these discussions were going on. So when they went out and did the rural zoning, the idea was to take those prime farmlands and put them in zones that, that would protect the prime farmland. So real quickly, in your mind, if you go through, and I've asked most legislators this, members of the media this, and it's an interesting discussion. In your mind, when you look out at rural Oregon, uh, if you thought about, you might just want to note this down for yourself and see what you'd answer. What percentage of private rural land in the state of Oregon, what percentage of private rural land in the state of Oregon is zoned as either exclusive farm or exclusive forest use? Is it zero to 20%, 20 to 40%, 40 to 60 percent, 60 to 80 percent, or 80 percent or above. So in your, in your mind right now, think of a number. Which one do you think that is? The answer is 97 percent. And I'm telling you, there was probably not a single person in the room that would have thought that it was 97 percent. Every single person I have ever asked that question have, of comes back with some number that's much less than that. Typically, the typical answer is on all sides of the political spectrum is somewhere between 30 and 50 percent of the land is in these prime farm and forest zones. Inherently, that was the problem with the planning system. We put everything outside of urban growth boundaries in exactly the same zone. So what we ended up with is, is we grow our cities, if you look at Hillsborough, if you look at Salem and Kaiser, if you look at Albany, you look at Eugenia, you look at Medford, we grow across the best farmland in the state and we tell people that they can't build a house someplace on the hill, and it doesn't make any sense. Many Oregonians would like the rural lifestyle, raise their kids in the country, have FFA or 4-H project, and it's a lifestyle that is legitimate that people can choose. Those opportunities have been shut down. Therein lies the problem. The original intent, if you listen to the tapes in 1973, and like I said, I've listened to them before, and I've listened to all of them, and I, and I've, I heard the discussion, was a very noble attempt at creating a planning system that balanced the rights of property owners, with a desire of the community to go forward and plan for the future. The idea was is to protect the rural, uh, the rural economy while also having orderly growth in urban areas. And from my view, the message that has been come, that people have been trying to send forward to especially folks in the Portland metropolitan area is the system's broken and it needs to be fixed. Ballot Measure 37 was response to that. That's where Ballot Measure 37 came from. Everybody knew it was coming. There was even a warning shot with the passage of Ballot Measure 7. And today what we have is, is a system where the voters have put in a fix. Now, you may have read in the paper that there's this huge problem with Ballot Measure 37. Let's talk about the reality. A few minutes ago you heard that there's 500,000 acres that are affected by Ballot Measure 7, uh, 37. 500,000 acres. Let me put that in perspective. Remember the number that you said about how much land you think is currently, er, currently available for development that's not in prime farm forest zones? Think about that number you said. The amount of land that's been currently under a Measure 37 claim is 8 tenths of 1 percent of the total land mass in the state and 1.5 percent of all private rural land in the state. It's a minuscule amount of the land in the state. Number two, if you take all the houses requested under ballot measures, uh, ballot measure uh, 37, and you divide it into the number of acres, the average request is one house on 12 acres. 
The problem is, is that there are some isolated requests out there that go far beyond what urban services, beyond what, what services can provide. The vast majority of Measure 37 claims are rural residences or small rural developments that are consistent with the land use pattern of the area. That's what they are. The question is, is that how do we plan for that kind of lifestyle? And the bottom line is, is that, that we have a great opportunity to do so within the confines of the legislature this year and then into the next legislative session when the Big Look Task Force, a task force put together by Governor Kulangoski, comes back and reports to the legislature of the major reforms needed to the land use system. We have a choice from where we sit right now. You can, we can continue down the path of saying, you are either pro this system or you're anti-land use planning, we're anti-measure set 37, or you're pro-measure 37, or we can try to fix it. It's either a system based on conflict or it's a system based on collaboration. That's the choices. If people don't like measure 37, I'm always amazed. I'm like, well, what, what do you not like about it? And there's one or two isolated situations, but the vast majority of these things are incredibly fair. The vast majority of claims are reasonable. If you went through and you looked at them, it's just incredibly consistent with land use pattern of the area. It's sustainable, it's acceptable. The question is, is that how do we deal, how do we function with some of these ones that are these bigger claims that are problematic? And that's why ballot measure 37 is state statute. And how do we put some sideboards in to say to, to, the, to folks, hey, look, what you're asking for is not consistent with land use pattern of the area. What we need is, is that you, you can't supply the roads, you can't play, supply this or water or sewer or whatever. And that's the job that we have before us. Um, Representative McPherson and I have sat through hours and hours of testimony on this point. And the, the fact is, is that when you sit there and, and listen to folks on both sides, there are those that say, hey, I want my rights restored. And there are those that are say, hey, I already have my place in the rural countryside and I don't want neighbors. Well, there's got to be a way to deal with that. And there's got to be a way to address those issues. And folks that say we should repeal ballot measure 37 never got the first message from ballot measure 7 or 37, which there are fundamental flaws with the system that we need to fix. There are fundamental issues on implementation of the overall land use system that we need to have addressed. One of the things I'd hoped for when we started the, 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 um, the uh, Special Committee on Land Use Fairness is when I talked to the Senate President and agreed to serve on the committee, my, my understanding is we're going to have a discussion on the broader issues. So, but unfortunately, many of the land use issues outside of ballot measure 37 never got sent to our committee. They instead got diverted to another committee. So we haven't had to be able to be, talk about the broader discussion. But that will happen next legislative session. For this legislative session, we're dealing with the issue of how we put these sideboards on. And I think when I look and I, I had uh, my staff poll, how many of the 7,500 claims that are out there are the problematic claims that people are concerned with? And statewide, there's 90 claims where people ask for, for, um, for developments that are one acre or less. Understand the Land Conservation Development Commission, the LCDC, determines that it is rural if it's over two acres, and if it's less than two acres, then it's, then it's not considered rural. So we are looking at developments that are basically asking for uh, one acre or less. What we found is there's 90 of them. There's 90 of these developments. And if you look at those, many of those are adjacent to urban growth boundaries where the cities are collaborating with the landowner to try to put those things into the urban growth boundaries. So it's actually consistent with land use uh, system anyway. The question is, how do we deal with those narrow claims that, are, that, are, that, that everybody finds go beyond the bounds of what is available to provide services for? That's a tough struggle. And that's the issues we're struggling with. And my view is, is that what we need to do is we need to put in some kind of system where we have some kind of minimum lot size to maintain the consistent rural pattern of the area. And then we make sure that urban area, that, that, that we can provide the services necessary to service those homes. I was pulling maps in Washington, Clackamas counties, where these claims were. And what was amazing is, if you look at these areas and they have all of these houses on twos and five acres all over the place, and there's a 20 acre parcel in there where somebody asked for 10, 10 houses. It's completely consistent with the pattern of the area. And what is frustrating, I think, for many of us who work in this area is, is that, unfortunately, the debate that's gone on at the broader, uh, at the broader discussion has been, uh, what's, been, what's gone on is, is that there's been too much hype on all sides. And so if you ask me, can this problem be solved, and my answer is yes. But when I, told, when I came here and discussed this with you in 1993, I also said yes. 
I said that what we could do is we could create a system that was built on collaboration that brought in the concerns of rural Oregonians, match those with the uh, concerns of the urban Oregonians, and we together could go forward to reform the land use system and now reform ballot measure 37 in a way that made everybody happy. And I absolutely believe, knowing the discussions I've had over the last 15 years of my life where I worked on these issues, that there is complete middle ground. There is an opportunity to go forward with a system that is consistent with the values that Oregonians hold. I all the polling that I've looked at on ballot measure 37 is the fact is, is that there's a narrow small group of Oregonians who actually care about the implementation, but most Oregonians still sit pretty much where they were when ballot measure uh, 37 passed. And I just saw a poll that came out just this last week and it's consistent. The problem is, is that for those of us who are on the inside of these things, we recognize that there's all kinds of opportunity to solve problems. For so many years, we have had land use debates that have centered on this idea of conflict and have not focused on solutions. I was just down in Wilsonville this morning discussing with a group of citizens who are frustrated because the land use planning system did not coordinate in a way that would allow for the I-5 Sherwood 99W connector to be built. And now Tualatin has built in the way and the pathway of that where that would be. Now it's going to disrupt the planning of Wilsonville. It's creating all kinds of havoc. When it comes to transportation, when it comes to density, when it comes to all the different issues that are going forward, we have so many issues facing Oregonians when it comes to the issues of planning. At some point, people are going to have to say, you know what, it's okay for people to build a house in the rural countryside on their own property. It's okay for people to live in rural areas, but let's plan this stuff. Let's go forward. Let's not zone everything the same and create restrictions and block people from doing things that are completely reasonable on their property. And let's go forward with something that gives people some flexibility, at the same time maintain the character of the area. I make my living in food processing. If I had my way, nobody would ever move to this state. In fact, if I had my way, people would be forced to plant hazelnuts. <laughs> um, but what I think doesn't necessarily always go, and I can't force people to do what I want them to do. And people say, well, you're against agriculture. My entire life investment is invested in food processing. If I thought ballot measure 37, or if I thought that what we were doing and trying to reform Morgan's land use planning system would hurt agriculture, I'm directly hurting myself. The bottom line is, is for all the hype you hear, ballot measure 37 affects 1.5% of all the private rural land in this state, and the average claim is one house on 12 acres. That could be right next to your house, and you probably wouldn't notice. That's the bottom line. And then how do we go forward and fix it from here how do we fix the system from here? And that's a challenge. I urge, I guess what I come here today is urge all of you, because I know, I know the City Club has taken different positions than I would have on a number of these issues dealing with land use. But what I strongly urge the City Club to think about as you go forward is, is that maybe, maybe challenge everybody's thought process. Maybe challenge your own thought process. Open up and look out there and say, could there have been problems that we didn't see? Are there issues that we've been insensitive to that affects somebody in Roseburg or Medford or in Klamath Falls? And the answer is, is that there's got to be a way to solve these problems on a broad scale, and not just with Measure 37, but the entire land use planning system. I want to thank you very much for the opportunity to come and visit and look forward to your questions. Thank you. Well, I appreciate uh, Senator George joining me at uh, City Club today. Uh, and we, we both grew up um, in rural Oregon on two different kinds of farms. Uh, and now we both serve in the legislature. No doubt we draw some lessons from that experience. Uh, his from his experience with nuts and mine with my experience with large bovines. And I'll leave to your imagination which you think is more uh, appropriate to the task. <laughs> In ballot measure 37, we see a clash between Oregonians who believe that they have the right to do with their land as they wish, uh, and an icon of Oregon's environmental tradition, the system of statewide land use planning that was enacted in 1973 with Senate Bill 100, which aims largely to preserve Oregon's natural resource base of farm and forest lands. I'd like to focus in on what's happening 
right now with Measure 37 claims because it's, it's, a, it's a fairly troublesome situation. Uh, as noted before, there are about 7,500 claims that have been filed statewide. And each one of those claims states an amount of compensation that is to be received by the property owner. And the total amount of all the compensation claims that have been made is about $10 billion. That's billion with a B. Measure 37 provides that um, the filing of a claim starts the running of a 180-day clock. And if land use restrictions um, are not waived by the end of that 180-day clock, uh, then the property owner has the right to sue the state or local government to recover that amount of compensation plus attorney's fees. And over half of those 7,500 claims were filed in a five-week period last fall. Uh, and that's because the measure had a, a procedural deadline of December the 4th of 2006, uh, after which it became more difficult for claimants to file a claim. Not impossible, but more difficult. Uh, this surge in claims has swamped land use uh, planning offices uh, because they have to confirm historical ownership data in order to determine whether that property owner, in fact, did own the property back at the time when a land use restriction was applied. Uh, that 180-day cl clock is running, and billions of dollars of liability turn on whether that clock continues to run or whether we accomplish something in this legislative session. Uh, our Committee on Land Use Fairness, when, which I serve with, along with Senator George, uh, has been tasked to deal with this problem. Uh, and we are, have considered initially a proposal to uh, put a temporary hold on most Measure 37 claims along with um, an expedited treatment of small claims, ones that were for, for a single additional home site. And we held a number of public hearings on that bill, the Senate Bill 505. The room was packed to overflowing with people who were felt passionately on both sides. Uh, and um, in the end, what we concluded was that Senate Bill 505 was much more modest than either the uh, opponents or uh, proponents of that bill regarded it as because it would not have continued in effect past June 30. Uh, and so it was more important for us to take on the main task, which is to look at Measure 37 and figure out what should be done with it. Uh, so we had to focus in on the language of the measure and the particular problems that have arisen under it. Uh, measure 37's ballot title presented to voters the following words, governments must pay owners or forego enforcement when certain land use restrictions reduce property value. Uh, the core idea behind this measure is one of fairness, that land use restrictions that reduce the value of property should be waived unless the owner is paid compensation in the amount of the reduction in value of the property. And Oregonians, by a substantial margin, voted for that measure. Uh, they were also persuaded by the uh, the profile of elderly Oregonians who had acquired their property many years ago and always planned to split off uh, a home site or two or more for their children or to sell it to uh, support them in their old age. Uh, there, are, um, Among those 7,500 claims, there are many thousands of acres of property that are covered. Most of them are for rural residential development outside of urban growth boundaries, and they're concentrated in the rural lands in Washington and Clackamas counties, quite a few claims in Hood River County as well. Uh, it's true that it's not a high proportion of the state's total land mass, but when you visualize a map of Oregon, you realize that the northwest quadrant is where most Oregonians live uh, and where there's the greatest development pressure, and it's largely in that quadrant of the state where the claims arise. And the claims are primarily within a, a commuting distance of the urban parts of the state. Uh, it is a, a significantly higher proportion uh, the, than um, of the total land mass when you look at private land that's outside of urban growth boundaries, and even higher when you look at the state's prime farmlands. Uh, some claims are for an extra home or two, as was, has been noted, but others seek hundreds of houses in large subdivisions. Uh, if all the development that was, is pursued in Measure 37 claims were actually developed, we would see large subdivisions in places in the Willamette Valley, the Hood River Valley, and up and down the Coast, coast Range, and other parts of Oregon as well. Uh, our committee has heard from many Oregonians who say, uh, I voted for ballot Measure 37, but I didn't want this. Uh, the large scale of claimed development is certainly a major flaw with Measure 37. 
So how did this measure that uh, promise to pay landowners compensation bring us here? Uh, it's because Measure 37 is flawed in that it provides no funding source for paying compensation. It told the state and local governments to pay property owners, but it gave them no money with, with, with which to do so. Uh, so Measure 37 claims ask for an amount of compensation and uh, that totals, as I noted before, about $10 billion. And when we struggle to pay for schools, state police, and for health care, we can't afford to pay uh, even a small fraction of that amount. The only choice for the state and, and local governments is to waive uh, land use restrictions in order to avoid exposure to that liability. Another flaw in Measure 37 lies in how a reduction in value is figured. Uh, most claims use <clears throat> the value of the property that it would have if the restriction complained about is lifted, but still applied to all other property owners. Economists who spoke to our committee explained the fundamental flaw in that analysis. Uh, and they illustrated it with, a, with an example where if you had a subdivision that had potential views of Mount Hood, uh, and before the houses are built, then a restriction is placed that limits their, their height to, say, 30 feet. And then one lot owner in that subdivision could claim, um, could claim the uh, Measure 37 right to claim to build higher and might claim that the value that he's uh, that suffered, uh, the reduction in value, is the loss of a view of Mount Hood. But if none of the lots in the subdivision were subject to, uh, to that height restriction, the view wouldn't be there and there would probably be no loss in value. And it's that, that single exception methodology that's one of the real flaws uh, in the application of this measure. Uh, valuations under Measure 37 are also flawed in not considering tax effects. Uh, when, measure, when Senate Bill 100 was passed back in 1973, there was the companion Senate Bill 101, uh, which provided a reduction in uh, property taxes on natural resource lands, and many property owners have enjoyed a major reduction over the years as a result uh, of that, those tax abatements. It's true that uh, there are recapture rules uh, for the last five or ten years, but many of these property owners have enjoyed those reductions in property taxes for say 30 years and, uh, and so to have them uh, not have that as part of the analysis of a reduction in value seems, seems like a flaw to the methodology. Yet another flaw in Measure 37 is the rigidity in how it tracks ownership. It refers to the owner of the property, which is clear enough if say John Jones bought a certain property in 1970 and still owns it today. Uh, but what if John died 10 years ago and the property, property passed to his wife, Mary Jones, at that time? Uh, what if John and Mary transferred the property into a living trust a few years back? Well, the literal language of the measure is the property owner, and the courts have held that it means the owner who's on the title to the property now when the claim is made. Uh, this brings us to another of Measure 37's flaws. Uh, the courts have held that the rights created by a waiver of land use restrictions are not transferable. Uh, for example, as <clears throat> assume that the uh, Joneses who bought their property in, uh, in 1970 built a house and raised their family there. They expected to divide off two additional lots eventually and sell them, uh, but the property was later zoned for exclusive farm use. Along comes, comes Measure 37 promising the Joneses compensation or a waiver. Uh, they enthusiastically file a claim seeking two more home sites in the county and the state grant measure 37 waivers. But the waiver applies only to the Joneses. If they sell the property to Acme Home Builders, Acme doesn't get the right to build the homes. The Joneses have a waiver, but it's not worth much if they can't sell it. Uh, but imagine the Joneses have saved for their retirement and they decide to use their life savings to build the two houses, which they have the right to do. Uh, when the first of those houses is built, they list it for sale, and the Smiths, a young couple, decide it would be a wonderful place to raise their family. Uh, but the Smiths can't get a mortgage to make the purchase because the house is, is non-conforming in a farm use zone. It's there because the Joneses had the right to build it, but when they sell it to the Smiths, the right goes away. The home doesn't have to be torn down, but even if, if, if it's ever destroyed by fire, it couldn't be rebuilt. And mortgage companies have told our committee uh, that they won't lend on a property that is in that situation. Uh, there's one type of claim less affected by this flaw of, of non-transferability, and those are large corporate owners. Measure 37 rights belong to property owners personally, and individuals like John and Mary Jones have a limited lifespan. 
They're, but business corporations, um, as I learned at law school, have perpetual existence. Uh, their rights never expire, and they also evolve through various mergers. Uh, the corporate owner of today may look entirely different from the, what the corporation looked like back in 1970 when the land was purchased. It's ironic that Measure 37, which was pitched as a help to individual elderly Oregonians, uh, is actually most useful to large corporations. Uh, we come finally to the greatest flaw in Measure 37. It focuses entirely on the rights of the owner of a particular property and doesn't say anything about the rights of neighboring property owners. There's a saying in real estate I'm sure you've all heard, location, location, location. What's going on around a property has a tremendous effect on its value, its usefulness, and its saleability. Uh, many Oregonians uh, bought their residences and invested in businesses relying on restrictions on how their neighbors can use their land. Measure 37 gives no recognition to the impacts on these neighbors. Our committee has heard about particular problems with the availability of water. Uh, most rural homes and many farmers rely on wells to, uh, for a source of water, uh, and water law gives priority to existing users over new users. Uh, uh, but the state law now allows a new well to draw out 15,000 gallons of water per day without getting a permit. If the rural residences that are allowed under Measure 37 develop on wells, as is expected, uh, the existing users may well run out of water, and I think their rights will then be infringed. Uh, so there we have it. Uh, implementation of Measure 37 has revealed its many flaws. Uh, there's the potential for large-scale development, uh, there's no fu funding sourced to pay compensation. Uh, there are overstated claims for reduction in property value. Spouses and family trusts are treated as new owners rather than and as uh, an extension of the original owner. Uh, the rights uh, that are given by waiver are often useless due to non-transferability. Uh, <clears throat> there's a lack of mortgage financing for homes that are, are allowed to be built. Uh, and there is the potential for infringement of water and other rights of neighbors. Uh, so what should we do about Measure 37? Uh, well, I hear from a lot of people on uh, both sides of the, uh, of the debate over the, this measure, and people on one side, many of them tell me we should repeal it. Uh, but there is a core idea in Measure 37 that was supported by a substantial majority of Oregonians, and on that I would agree with Senator George. Uh, we need to address that sense of unfairness that um, Oregonians felt uh, that, and, and motivated the vote on the measure. So I believe it's better to fix the flaws in Ballot Measure 37 so that it achieves what its purpose was, and to the, that is the fairness that Oregonians were asking for. And that's what our Committee on Land Use Fairness is uh, trying to do. Uh, now we, we sometimes hear from the, uh, the, those who are advocates of Measure 37 uh, that it should just be left alone, uh, that we shouldn't touch it because it's the will of the voters. Uh, but I would say the, the drafters of Measure 37 got one thing right. They passed a measure which uh, put a set of rules into statute, and a statute can be amended by the legislature. Uh, and um, I think that we not only have the authority to do that, but we have the duty to do it when you see something that is not functioning um, as it should, and uh, not benefiting Oregonians broadly. And uh, I look forward to our further work to accomplish that task. Thank you very much. A privilege of membership in City Club is to ask uh, questions of our guests. I'd ask that you keep your questions brief so as to allow time for others. Our first question today will be asked by board host Chip Lazenby. Chip is a member of the City Club Board of Governors. He's general counsel for Portland State University, and he's a principal in Lazenby and Associates. Chip. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I've been following these questions around Measure 37 and first Measure 7 and then uh, when I was with Governor Kitzhaber and then uh, Measure 37 and I'm, I'm often reminded of um, the great American writer William Saroyan who at the end of his life was informed by his doctors that he had about two weeks to live and 
in one of his final interviews was asked by a reporter about death and he said, well, all my life I knew I was going to die. It's just somehow I thought an exception would be made in my case. Uh, given that, um, the question I'm going to ask, a, a sort of a prefatory question, but different punchlines for, for both of these folks. I, I think Representative McPherson is correct. A lot of these are, are in and around urban areas, and there's kind of a chain of logic that goes claims, relief from planning, stress on urban infrastructure, stress on, on farmland, which leads to sprawl. You're going to get a transportation question really soon. Um, but. I guess the question to Larry George is, is there ability, a political ability to draw a line on the idyllic vision that you put out there about a little house on a hill on a private property so that it is just a single dwelling and not the corporate benefits that we've seen in some of the other cases that are out there? And then to Representative McPherson, is it possible to develop a system legislatively that will balance all the costs that you talked about? the cost to neighbors, the cost of, uh, and a true cost of regulation and its impact on property values. Thank you, Chip. I, one of the things that I think is, um, is key in this discussion is that the only reason why people are concerned about the impacts of Measure 37 is because there's a huge group of Oregonians who would love to live out in the country. I mean, therein lies the problem. You have people who want to sell and you have people who would love to raise their kids in the country. I grew up in Newburgh and my FFA chapter, we used to call it Future Farmers of America, but we're not allowed to do that anymore, but our FFA chapter, there were 75 of us. Two of us came from commercial farms. Two of us came from commercial farms. The rest of the people that were in my FFA chapter were people who lived on small five or 10 acre parcels, uh, or even smaller, had uh, one or two, had a cow, some pigs, and would show them at the fair, and were incredibly supportive of agriculture in the state. If you look at the census of agriculture, are absolutely the most productive farms that we have in this state, even though for, for my particular family we're larger commercial farmers, the most productive farms we have in this state are actually farms that are 10 acres or less per acre. It's, it makes sense because what happens is people put more inputs in per acre in both labor and in, and in cost. So I guess the question you have to ask yourself, Chip, is, is that who ultimately are going to be the owners of these properties? Uh, and my belief is, is if you look at, for instance, Washington County, Clackamas County, and you look at existing use maps that are there, and you look at how, what happens under ballot measure 37, many of these, many of these claims are, consist, are, are consistent with land use pattern of the area, or for instance, the big claim in Washington County, which happens to do with a timber company, are timber lands that, uh, that are close to already uh, developed areas. And so the question really is, is that what, what's my impact on the, on the big corporations? Well, I don't have any big belief that we ought to defend big corporations. I don't have any real impact. However, I do believe that there are people out there who would like to have that rural lifestyle, who would like to raise their kids in the country, and I'm not sure it conflicts with agriculture, as long as we don't have really tight subdivisions. And I think one of the things I brought up in committee is, is that it's one of the things I've advocated for within Ballot Measure 37 is perhaps what would be great, what would be best, is some kind of minimum lot size that would make sure that we maintain the rural character of wherever it was. Uh, you look at, at our commercial farm and surrounding our commercial farm are two and a half acre parcels that have been our family friends since the time I was a kid. Most of them work in Portland or work in Salem or work in McMinnville or something else like that. But the fact is, is that they were completely supportive of our agricultural practices and that we had ability to work with them. So the tough thing to do is, is that I guess I'm not all that concerned with the big corporations, and I think what's going to end up happening is in these negotiations that some of these big corporations will get thrown under the bus. The question really is who's the ultimate owner. I'm not that wound up. I do want to defend the people who want 10 or 20 uh, parcels, and that's what their zoning allowed them to do when they bought the land. I mean, that, you understand, folks, a lot of these people bought this land that was zoned. It was zoned when they bought it, and it was changed without them being notified. I mean, that's a really important thing that's part of this discussion. So I don't think we're, I don't think we're trying to draw too many lines between corporate and non-corporate. However, I mean, there, obviously there's less sympathy for the big corporates. Yeah, the, um, the, I, I share the sort of the romantic vision that um, uh, Senator George has, having grown up in the country myself, and there are a lot of great things about that lifestyle. I, I would say about it that the, the people who want to move to rural Oregon now oftentimes want both. 
uh, they want to be able to commute into town to work, uh, and they want the, the level of services, or at least a high level of services, uh, higher than what people enjoyed back when I was growing up, uh, when it, oftentimes we were doing without electricity, for example, for stretches of time, uh, days at a time. Uh, and, um, and the extension of those services to rural residences is expensive. Uh, and there are, I think, serious issues about whether um, the rural residential lifestyle pays its own way in terms of supporting public services. And so that's one of the challenges we have to deal with here. Now, the question that was posed to me is, is it possible to balance the, these, these issues? And I, I think that, in the end, there, there is um, a strong desire on the part of a number of Oregonians to live um, outside of urban growth boundaries. And I think one of the consequences of a fix to Measure 37 will be some increase in, in rural residential uh, circumstances for people, as people living out in the land. Uh, what we need to do is to handle that in a way so that it doesn't unduly infringe on other people, for example, on the water rights of existing users. Yes. <clears throat> Arnold Kogan, member of the City Club. Um, Thirty-four years ago, a very courageous legislature passed these two bills that you've both spoken about. Senate Bill 100, which uh, we, we know quite a bit about. Senate Bill 101, which I suspect few people know very much about. Uh, Representative McPherson, you spoke about that, and, and there's been a lot in the press lately about how uh, farmland owners, rural owners, people who actively farm, have been adequately compensated under the provisions of Senate Bill 101. So hasn't that compensation already been given to people who own land in the, <clears throat> in the rural areas who actively farm? So my question is that if, if that's the case, and should we recognize also that a substantial majority, at least according to many polls that have been published, favor repeal of this measure, isn't it time for the legislature to be also courageous as they were 34 years ago and bring about repeal of this terrible measure? Arnold, I, I think that if you go back and you look at it at 1973 and you look at the entire land use package and there was a schematic that the legislature, that the, the, basically in the Senate that they were working off of and Senate Bill 100 was at the top and then there was about seven other bills that were that did different things in real estate and 101 which was the incentive measure um, uh, for uh, farm tax and forest tax assessment. Uh, which was built in there, or expanding that program actually. But equal to the top, at the very top of the, of the program, there was another bill which is never discussed. And it was Senate Bill 849, 1973, introduced at the request of, the, of, of uh, Governor McCall's office. And Governor McCall's office came in and testified. If you look at Senate Bill 849, it is basically Senate Bill, I mean, it's basically Measure 37. It's actually probably closer to Measure 7. And it was a fundamental compensation measure that was part of the entire land use package. Governor McCall's staff comes in and testifies on this bill and says it is absolutely necessary that we pass a compensation measure to go along with the land use package or else the entire land use package won't work. That, that's on tape at the state archives. In addition, um, the, it was discussed uh, in the, before, the day before Senate Bill 100 passed out, 849 uh, was discussed in that committee and, and it was in a different committee, it was in revenue. And the discussion was asked of the sponsors of Senate Bill 100, well, what about the, comp the issue of compensation? And they said there's another bill and another committee that's dealing with that, and they'll move together. Well, it never moved. In addition, Section 24 of Senate Bill 100, if you'll look at that, Section 24 specifically instructed the uh, state to continue to research the issues of compensation, in addition to Senate Bill 101, which was an incentive measure. And understand the visual. The idea was we were going to protect our prime agricultural lands with strict zoning, and then the other agricultural lands that were not prime farmlands were going to be incentivized with Senate Bill 100, 101, and that's not what happened. So the deal was never done. The deal wasn't struck. It was never completed, and what ended up happening was everybody ended up with restrictions, and so they're basically taxed at the rate of what they can use their land for. So unfortunately, if you look at the math and then you look at the history, it doesn't really pencil out that way. And I, and I got to tell you, if you look at the tape, if you go back to the tapes, if everybody in this room sat down and listened to the tapes from 1973, we would all come to an agreement about what was intended and then what we have today. And remember, 97% of all private rural land 
that's land outside urban growth boundaries, is in, in these exclusive farm and forest zones, regardless of their productivity and regardless of what's being done on them. And that's just, it's an un injustice that has never been corrected. Uh, I, I've already commented on the tax effects, and I'm looking forward to Ray Polani's transportation question, so let's move, move <laughs> along. Ray Polani, a City Club member. Uh, let me begin perhaps by stating what I think are two inconvenient truths. One is that transportation determines land use. The second one is that there are too many people and too many automobiles, and they both keep coming. If you want a third one, sprawl came about with the advent of the automobile. So, what should we be doing? And I would like to hear from our two representatives what they think about it, is change transportation and we will change land use. We should probably concentrate on urban and suburban. So here is the question. How about funding alternative transportation and defunding the automobile? I'll, I'll take a swing at that. <laughs> um, I would have to say uh, funding uh, uh, mass transit is really beyond the, the scope of the Fairness Committee, uh, so we'll leave that to another day. But I think the, the core point is a valid one, which is that what makes the rural lifestyle um, attractive is the, uh, the relative ease with which people can drive in to get the services they want in town and then get back out to their homes. If people were isolated out on farms, they would find that lifestyle probably a good deal less attractive than it, uh, than it, than it is as a, today in an era of cheap oil. Hi, Kathleen Warman, City Club member. My question has to do with why Measure 37 claims are not expedited. Why does it drag out so long? I just spoke with Dorothy English. She still hasn't gotten where she's trying to go. The, um, as I think I'm, I, I just said in my prepared remarks, th there's a 180-day period for processing Measure 37 claims. And the, the thing that takes the most time in that process is confirming ownership because the measure says that you have to be the owner of the property today and at an earlier time when a land use restriction was put into effect. And uh, deed records are not as easy to work with as you might imagine. And so it's not an easy thing to go back and confirm that it is the same person who owned the property. And you get into these questions about name changes or marriages, divorces. It, it's, a, it's sort of a, 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 it's a social history process that sometimes occurs in the handling of these Measure 37 claims. And the state and the, and the counties who are handling the vast majority of the claims, they have to get it right because if they waive land use restrictions for somebody who's not entitled to them. They expose the jurisdiction to claims for or, or lawsuits from people who feel tr uh, aggrieved by, by the uh, development that would be allowed. So they have to get it right, and it's a hard process, and they've got this surge of claims. I mean, half of all the claims were filed in a five-week period. But Dorothy's was the first one filed, and she, everybody knows she owns it. Kathleen, I'll, I'll let um, it's my microphone. Uh, Kathleen, one of, I think that, and, and, and I'm not trying to accuse anybody of anything, but what you're going to find is, is that in counties that are more friendly, that are using a collaborative approach with landowners, you're seeing the, the process much easier to go through, and the claims are being processed faster. And in counties that are um, more opposed to the implementation of ballot measure 37, it's getting tougher. And so it, it, a lot of it has to do with scrutiny, but a lot of it has to do with a lot of the counties that are being more collaborative are finding that the landowners will actually work with the, the landowners will work with the county to actually do the implementation and, and maybe pull back part of their claims. Or in fact, a lot of people have made claims that they never plan to go forward with their attorney asked them to go for a maximum amount. So what you're finding is, is that some counties are finding it very easy to go through the process. It's pretty crystal clear when you talk to those planning departments about how they're going through it. And then there's others that are finding it very, very difficult to go through. But one of the things that I think is important is this is we need kind of a statewide, one of the things that can be done in this, in addition to some of the things that Representative McPherson discussed, is some kind of statewide process that would make it simpler and, and streamline the process a little bit. Because clearly some counties are much better at this than other counties are. So I, there's, some, there's some wiggle room in there where perhaps we could provide some assistance and streamline that process. Thanks. Good afternoon, Mark Anderson, club member and 
just for people's information, the club has a research report, and I'm part of the advocacy committee for that. It's available on our website. My question is, the club, among many others, has studied this issue. These issues have been around, as the speakers have said, for 30 some odd years. There have been proposals on the table to address some of the problems for some of the people who lose significantly under land use planning. I know we Oregonians are collectively frugal, but can't we somehow find the political will to finally address compensating some people and making adjustments for others, what makes you think this legislature can or cannot accomplish what the last 30 years of legislation has not been able to do? Uh, one, one wonders what uh, the vote would have been on Measure 37 if the first three words, uh, instead of governments must pay, had been taxpayers must pay. Uh, I, I, you know, the, the, the I, I think the core idea of Measure 37 was appealing to people, but I don't think it was appealing enough that they would have wanted to pull out their checkbook for it. One of the things we found is, is that ballot measure 7 was just a compensation measure and got 54 percent of the vote, but once you added the waiver effect, it went up to 61 percent with ballot measure 37. So the voters were much more willing to go along with kind of get grandfathering people's rights in. And so there was much more, there was much more of a, uh, of a positive attitude towards the grandfathering, towards letting people use the property for what it was owned when they bought it. So that, that whole grandfathering issue probably could have been solved during any time in the last 30 years. And the reason why I think that there's more effort to do, to, to solve the problem this time, is that Measure 37 and Measure 7 before it has forced the discussion to this point. It's actually sort of put landowners and the advocates for the current system on, on even footing. And so all of a sudden, it isn't one side dominates the, the high ground and the, and, and the public opinion. It is clearly much more even. And what it's done is it's, it's sort of required those of us who disagree on some of the details, it forces us to the table. And for that, folks, I'm going to tell you, if you don't agree with Measure 37, I will tell you this. It has forced an important, decision, an important discussion that never would have happened had it not passed. And for that, the entire state, I'd be thankful because that was a discussion that was just festering to be, create more and more animosity between urban and rural. Lee Stevenson Kuhn, a city club member. Uh, and this is maybe a refinement of the funding issue you were just discussing. Uh, why don't you do two things? Number one, prohibit waivers and, and say you can only be compensated. And number two, the compensation will come when the taxpayers approve it. <laughs> then we'll see if people who like Measure 37 put their money where their mouth is. I, 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 I've served in legislative uh, uh, process long enough to know that brinksmanship is, doesn't usually necessarily get us uh, where we want to go. <laughs> Uh, and uh, I, I would say, I, I think that there is um, a, a compromise that can be struck that allows some degree of development, less than what Measure 37 allows, and will to allow an addition to the, um, the rural lifestyle that Senator George has, has spoken about, uh, but which doesn't have the large scale impact on our landscape that, uh, uh, that uh, we fear when we look at the maps of Measure 37 claims. Uh, but that's, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of ground to cover between that sort of general statement that we can do it to, to actually getting something hammered out. And and I'll tell you, it comes back to if you look at the polling and you look at the results, the the voters in this state, the majority of voters in this state, uh, I th and I think it's partly self-interest. A lot of people look and say, hey, I'd love to have five, two and a half, five acres out in the country. They actually the public supports the waivers more than they support the compensation. And it's one of the reasons why we think the, the vote got stronger, even though the opposition spent a ton of money, because of the fact that people like the idea of, good, we don't have to pay for it. Just give people back their zoning that they had when they, when they had it. And I think that the public generally supports that, partly because they think it's fair and partly because of the fact that, that they probably would like that kind of lifestyle sometime in the future. I'm sorry to say that we are out of time. On behalf of the City Club of Portland, I'd like to thank our members and guests for your participation here today, thank our radio and television audience for your interest in City Club, and ask you to join me in thanking Senator George and Representative McPherson for a very thoughtful and interesting discussion.
we are adjourned.